Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the third lecture in chapter 11. This will wrap up our discussion over muscle tissue. And after this, we will have one more lecture in unit four. We'll have our fourth exam. And then we will have one remaining lecture that will fall after the fourth exam and will contain information that will be on the final in addition to all of the other cumulative material. But before we wrap up for today, let's talk about not really attendance questions. First, what is the role of ATP in muscle contraction? Next, what is the role of calcium at the neuromuscular junction? And what is the role of calcium in muscle contraction? Go ahead and try to answer those. Those should be pretty fresh in your mind as they were just discussed recently. So let's see what the answers are. What is the role of ATP in muscle contraction? Remember, ATP provided the energy needed to break the cross bridge. Next, what is the role of calcium at the neuromuscular junction? This could also have said, what is the role of calcium at a synapse? It doesn't have to be a neuromuscular junction synapse. It could be any synapse. Calcium, when it comes into the axon terminal, it binds to the vesicles containing neurotransmitters, causes them to migrate to the edge of the cell, and that neurotransmitter is then exocytosed. And finally, what is the role of calcium in muscle contraction? Calcium inside of a muscle, remember, is held inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's released when an action potential travels down the T-tubule. Calcium is now going to be released into the interior of the muscle cell, where it binds to troponin, exposing the active site on actin so that cross bridges can form. So calcium plays a couple of different roles here in things that we've been talking about recently. So let's go ahead and dive into our last bit of material for muscles, and we're gonna talk about the length tension relationship. The relationship between length of a muscle fiber and how hard that muscle can contract. So if we have a muscle cell that is partially contracted, what we end up with is there's not as much room left for that muscle to continue contracting. So if a muscle cell is partially contracted, then the strength of the contraction will decrease. And now here in this image, we see an overly contracted muscle cell. Or specifically, we see an overly contracted bit of the muscle cell looking at some of the fibrils. And we can see in this image, there's really not much left to contract at all. It's going to end up bumping the Z-disc to the end of this thick filament. So an overly contracted muscle cell has hardly any contractile strength at all. Let's go over here and look at overly stretched muscle. Overly stretched muscle, we've pulled the thin filaments very, very far, and there's not a lot of room for these cross bridges to form. So we get a very, very weak contraction if the muscle is overly stretched. But right here, at a muscle cell that is slightly stretched, and it's really stretched a little bit more than 100% of its resting length. So a muscle cell that is slightly stretched is going to give us the optimal contractile strength. And that's because there's still a lot of room for the contraction to occur. There's a lot of room for these cross bridges to grab hold. And more cross bridges 
gives us more ability to move each side of the sarcomere. So optimal resting length is slightly stretched. And slightly stretched gives us the greatest contractile strength. That is going to be really important for Bio 139. Slightly stretched muscle contracts harder. Now, at the last lecture, we mentioned muscle tone a little bit. You've also mentioned muscle tone or tonus in lab. But just to refresh on muscle tone, you are never fully relaxed. And that's because your central nervous system is constantly sending low levels of signals to your muscles. And we are alternating. So remember when we talked about motor units? We're sending signals to one motor unit and then we stop. Then we send signals to a different motor unit and we stop. We send signals to a different motor unit and we stop. So we're constantly having a little bit of stimulation to our muscles, which means our muscles are constantly just a little bit contracted. This is even when you are at your most relaxed, even when you're sleeping, even if you are knocked unconscious, then we're, we're even then sending signals to our muscles so that our muscles are slightly contracted. Now, the only time this changes is, as we saw previously, at death, when we are no longer sending electrical signals, action potentials, or if there's some sort of nerve damage. If we destroy a nerve that supplies a muscle, then that muscle will go fully relaxed because there's no stimulation there anymore. But muscle tone or tonus is that constant low level of tension in a muscle because of the constant low level of stimulation from the central nervous system. So let's talk about something called a muscle twitch. Now, I personally don't like this name because normally when we think of a muscle twitch, we think of that weird jerky movement that sometimes we have. That is not a muscle twitch. A muscle twitch is a laboratory phenomenon that we use to study how muscles behave. And a muscle twitch is a reaction to a single action potential. Now this doesn't happen in our bodies. When we're contracting a muscle, we are sending repeated action potentials. Remember when we talked about the cross bridge cycle? We said that one single cross bridge cycle does not result in any noticeable shortening of the muscle. So what we have to do if we're wanting to contract a muscle is send repeated action potentials so that that muscle will continue to contract. But a muscle twitch is what would happen if we applied one single action potential to a muscle cell. And that's what we see here. This is the graph of a muscle twitch. And it's divided into three areas. It's called the latent period, the contraction period or contraction phase, and the relaxation period or the relaxation phase. So different things are occurring at each one. So let's look into this graph and see what it's showing us. Right down here it says time of stimulation. So this is the point when the action potential arrives at the muscle cell. From the time that the muscle, I mean that the action potential arrives at the muscle cell until the time that the muscle starts contracting. This is called the latent period. And there are things happening during the latent period, even though the muscle isn't contracting yet. So, all of those things that we talked about during excitation contraction coupling, that's the latent period. The action potential arrives, the action potential spreads along the sarcolemma, travels down the T-tubule, calcium is released into the interior of the muscle cell, calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin is moved out of the way, cross bridges form. All of that is happening here in the latent period. So we can see that's a really short time. So that all happened really quick. But as soon as the cross bridges form, we can see this graph 
the red line is showing us tension within the muscle cell. So once the cross bridge is formed, now we're going to start the next phase, the contraction phase. And this is the cross bridge cycle. Tension builds. But since we are not sending more action potentials, that calcium is pretty much immediately going to be removed and pulled back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, right here at the peak of this graph, this is when the calcium is now removed from the troponin. And if we remove calcium from the troponin, what happens? It goes back to its original shape. We cover the actin active sites back up, and we have no more cross bridges. So titan, remember the little springy protein? It's going to pull all of those fibrils back to their resting position. And that's what we see right here. Tension drops, and then we're back to rest. So this happens extremely quickly. And this does not happen, like I said, this does not happen in the body. Because when we're contracting a muscle, we send repeated action potentials. This is something that we could do in a lab if we apply a single action potential to a muscle cell. So let's look at some other things that influence contract contraction strength of those twitches and overall contraction strength of the muscle. Well, degree of stretch, as we talked about on our first slide. But next, something else that you've talked about in lab, and that is fatigue especially physiological fatigue. Remember, psychological fatigue was basically, this hurts, I'm not going to keep doing it, so we stop telling the muscles to contract. That's not what we're talking about here. Physiological fatigue. If we're using up the ATP, and if we use up the ATP faster than we can replace it, our muscles give out. They fatigue. Next, temperature. And slight increase in temperature. So as our muscles warm up, that warming up actually increases some enzyme activity within the muscle cells. And those enzymes help with muscle contractions. So as temperature slightly increases, we get a stronger contractile strength. Hydration state. Well, if we are dehydrated, then we don't have as much water in our body as we need to. And remember, our body is mostly water. It's like 75-80% water in some cases. So if we are removing water, we're also removing water from our cells. Let's look at what happens if we remove water from our muscle cells. Well, water takes up a lot of space in our muscle cells. If we remove it, then that space kind of compacts. And those sarcomeres, there's not going to be as much space in between the thick and thin filaments. So everything's kind of crowded. And if it's crowded, those cross bridges don't function as well. You know, if you try to move through a crowded room versus if you try to move through a mostly empty room, it's harder to move through the crowded room. It's harder for these cross bridges to function in a dehydrated and kind of crowded state. Stimulus frequency. Remember when we were talking about action potentials, greater stimulus strength produces more frequent action potentials? Well, more frequent action potentials will produce stronger muscle contractions. So let's talk about motor unit recruitment. We saw that there are many motor units in a whole muscle. If we have a few of those motor units contracting, then we'll get a pretty weak contraction. If we add a few more motor units, we get more cells contracting. The strength is going to be a little higher. As we add more and more and more motor units, we're adding more and more muscle cells. So the strength of the contraction increases. But something else happens during motor unit recruitment. 
different muscle cells are different sizes. And as we saw in the previous lecture, some motor units have very few cells, some motor units have a lot of cells. So the size principle says when we first start contracting a muscle, the motor units that begin work first have small cells or fewer cells. As we need to increase the strength of the contraction, we begin recruiting more motor units, and those motor units that we add gradually increase in the number of muscle cells and the size of those muscle cells, which allows for greater contractile strength. Also, as we increase stimulus frequency, we get temporal summation. Remember when we talked about temporal summation in neurons? This is very similar. Temporal summation is what happens when an action potential arrives before a muscle cell comes back to rest. So down here, we see one single twitch we come back to rest. And then another stimulus is applied, we get one single twitch, and we come back to rest. And another stimulus is applied, we get one single twitch, and we come back to rest. But what happens if we start increasing the frequency of the stimuli, which is what we see down here at the bottom of the second picture? We send an action potential, we start to come back to rest, but before we get all the way back to rest, the next stimulus comes, so we get another twitch. But this next twitch, this next bit of contraction, even though it has the same magnitude, the same height of the wave, we started from a higher point. So the tension increased. And as long as we keep sending stimuli, and those stimuli action potentials arrive before we come back to rest, then the tension increases, increases, increases all the way up. That's temporal summation. And we get something called incomplete tetanus. Incomplete tetanus. That's just the muscle strength keeps increasing. We're stimulating the muscle cell before we come back to rest. But what if we really crank up the frequency? What if we send action potential so fast that there's no time for any relaxation at all between one stimulus and the next. That's what we see here. We get a solid, sustained contraction. This is called complete tetanus, or fused tetanus. Complete or fused tetanus results from stimuli that are so fast that we don't get any time for relaxation at all before the next stimulus comes. So we get a solid, sustained contraction. So if you've ever uh, seen a kid, you know, flex their muscles for you or whatever, when you strain your muscle and you hold it there, that is complete tetanus. Over here, this is a graph that's kind of demonstrating that motor unit recruitment. It's kind of a confusing image that's in your book, so I wanted to talk about it before we move on to the next slide. Down here at the bottom, and this is, this is all one thing, it all goes together. So down here at the bottom, we see if there is no tension at all in the muscle, if there is, and that's because there is very, very little stimulation. So, actually, let's, let's start at this top image and work our way down. This top image shows how strong of a stimulus are we applying to the muscle. Here in number one, very, very little stimulus. And down here we see there is no tension. Why is there no tension? Because this stimulus was so low we didn't reach threshold, and we have no muscle cells contracting. This image here, it's showing us how many neurons are active within a nerve. And we can see that there are no neurons. The, where they're not colored in red, it means there are no neurons 
active within this nerve because we didn't reach threshold. In image number, I mean, sorry, in number two, here we see still a little bit stronger stimulus, but again, it doesn't reach threshold. Same exact thing in the neuron, and again, no tension develops within the muscle. Here, number three, we've reached threshold, but just barely. So it just shows one neuron activated. This really just means very few. And we get a little bit of stimulus, I mean, sorry, a little bit of tension build within the muscle because, remember, this one neuron only stimulates a few muscle cells. If we now increase, so four, five, six, if we go four, five, six, we're increasing the stimulus voltage. So down here, we add a couple more, a couple more, a couple more neurons. And the more neurons we're adding, the more motor units we're adding. So four, five, six, we're increasing the tension because we have more muscle cells contracting. Now we get to seven. We've increased it even further. Here, number seven. Now we have all of those neurons in that nerve sending action potentials to the muscle, and we get maximum contraction. This is as hard as that muscle cell or that muscle, the whole muscle, can contract because all of the muscle fibers within are contracting. But what if we increase the voltage even further? Number eight, number nine, we just keep adding greater stimulus to those nerves. Well, in number seven, we already activated all of those neurons. You can't have more than all. So in number eight and number nine, we still have the same number of neurons that are being activated, which means down here, eight and nine have the same contraction strength as seven. Even though we increase the voltage, we can't activate more than all. So there does come a time when <clears throat> we are adding as much voltage as is reasonable. If we continue to add more, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't increase the strength of contraction because we're already activating all of our motor units. So let's talk about a couple of different types of contractions. There's isometric and isotonic. And let's see what the difference in those two are. In an isometric contraction, iso means equal, metra means length. So in an isometric contraction, as the muscle tension builds because the muscle is contracting, the muscle does not shorten. So tension increases, but length doesn't change. There's two ways to visualize this. One is if you try to pick up something that is heavier than you are capable of lifting. Well, the tension in your muscle builds, but the muscle doesn't shorten. If the muscle shortened, you would be lifting the thing. So the tension in the muscle builds, but the muscle does not shorten. But really, there is an isometric phase to your contractions. Let's say you go to pick up your book. As soon as you pick up your book, there is a time when that muscle gets very tense, but before your muscle starts to shorten. So, isometric contractions are a time when tension increases in the muscle, but the length of the muscle does not change. Next, we have isotonic contractions. So isotonic contractions occur when there is a change in length of the muscle, but not a change in tension in the muscle. So the tension level remains the same, but the length of the muscle changes. And that's what we see in these two images. Here is a weight. Let's just say this is a 10 pound weight. So the tension in the muscle is enough to move 10 pounds of weight. That doesn't change regardless of if we are raising 
or lowering the weight, there's still going to be enough tension for 10 pounds of weight. So, what's the difference between isotonic concentric contractions versus isotonic eccentric contractions? These are both isotonic. It is a change in length without a change in tension. In an isotonic concentric contraction, this is when the muscle is shortening, so we are lifting a weight. In an isotonic eccentric contraction, we are now letting the weight go back down while holding tension. This is why we, if you're lifting weights, you don't just let the weight drop in your arm and risk damaging your elbow. You're holding tension as you let the weight back down. So the muscle is lengthening, but the tension within the muscle doesn't change. Okay, so that's really the end of the, the main point of this chapter. We've been talking about skeletal muscle. But there are other types of muscle, as we saw in our tissue chapter. There is cardiac muscle, which is found only in the heart. And there is smooth muscle, which is found in several hollow organs throughout our body, like blood vessels or digestive tract, things like that. So I do want to at least talk a little bit about those two types of muscles before we wrap up. And these two types of muscles will come back in Bio 139. So I want to point out the real big topics now so that when you get to 139, it's not all brand new. Cardiac muscle, which is what we see right here, is involuntary. Up to this point, when we've been talking about skeletal muscle, those are the muscles that we think to move. When you're walking down the hall, you're telling your legs to move by telling those muscles to contract. When you're writing notes or typing on your laptop, those muscles, you're telling them to move. But cardiac muscle is involuntary. You don't have to think to make your heart beat, luckily. It just happens completely on its own, without any conscious input. Cardiac muscle is striated. It's striped when we look at it under a microscope, just like skeletal muscle was. But skeletal muscle is a long, straight fiber. Whereas cardiac muscle, the fibers branch. And that's what we see right here. We see a muscle cell going this way, and then it also branches and comes down here and goes back this way. So they're kind of Y-shaped or W-shaped sometimes. Cardiac muscle has something called intercalated discs. Well, remember skeletal muscle ran the length of the entire muscle. It is very, very long. but cardiac muscle, the cells are pretty short, and they join end to end with neighboring muscle cells, and that's what we see right here. That's what these dark stripes are in this image right here. Intercalated discs are where two cardiac muscle cells join end to end. And here, when we were talking about the different types of cell junctions, intercalated discs we used as an example for gap junctions and desmosomes. Gap junctions, it's allowing ions to move from one cell into the neighboring cell. This is going to allow action potentials to spread really, really easy through the heart. Desmosomes, really, really strong. They're going to allow these heart muscle cells to stay anchored to each other while allowing a little bit of flexibility. That's both at the intercalated disc. Where does calcium come from in a muscle cell? Well, when we talked about skeletal muscle, it was released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In cardiac muscle, if we look at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's pretty wimpy looking. It's, it's very, very small compared to skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle, there is a little bit of calcium stored in here that comes out, but the majority of calcium that's involved in cardiac muscle contraction, the calcium is actually coming into the cell 
from the extracellular space. And cardiac muscle, like skeletal muscle, contracts end to end. Here we can see that there are sar uh, sarcomeres in a cardiac muscle, and it contracts using that sliding filament theory, contracting end to end, just like we saw in skeletal muscle. Now we move to smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is really, really different from our other muscle types. It is involuntary the same way that cardiac muscle was. We don't have to think to cause our blood vessels to change diameter or to move food through our digestive tract. It does it on its own. Smooth muscle is non-striated. It doesn't have sarcomeres the same way that the cardiac and skeletal does. There are things resembling sarcomeres that we won't talk about, but it is non-striated. And its shape is very, very different also. We call it spindle-shaped or oval-shaped. It's like an oval that somebody pinched the ends of. And these cells are really, really small compared to either skeletal muscle cells or cardiac muscle cells. And we can see here they pack. They're not joined end to end the way cardiac muscle cells are. They're not long and straight the way skeletal muscle cells are. They're packed very tightly with their neighbors here. Now, here we do get some nervous input from the autonomic nervous system using varicosities. Varicosities were mentioned back in nervous tissue. And varicosities at the end of a neuron from the autonomic nervous system, instead of having axon terminals, we get varicosities. So here we see the axon, and now it starts to branch outward. And instead of having terminal boutons, we have those varicosities scattered all along the ends of that axon. And inside those cavioli, that's, I'm sorry, inside those varicosities, that's where we find those vesicles containing neurotransmitters. Not always ACH here. And those varicosities sit on the surface of the cells. And the cells have things called cavioli, which are kind of like motor end plates. They are sunken in areas. They're like little pits. And that's how that uh, neurotransmitter communicates with the muscle cell. So where does calcium come from in a smooth muscle cell? Almost entirely from the extracellular space. Similar to what we saw in cardiac muscle. And while cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle both had the same role for calcium, when calcium came in, it binds to troponin, pulls tropomyosin out of the way, all of that that we've talked about a few times now. Here, calcium binds to something called calmodulin. And since we don't have those same sarcomere layouts, the calmodulin kind of behaves the same way as troponin. The calmodulin allows for the contractions to occur. And the contractions, since we don't have sarcomeres in that same sliding filament theory, we don't get an end-to-end -end contraction. Instead, the entire muscle cell contracts in on itself. Here it is relaxed, and here it is contracted. There's a web that runs across the surface, and that's what contracts. So it's going to end to end, top to bottom, side to side, front to back. It's going to completely shrink in on itself. That's how a smooth muscle cell contracts. Disorders are self-study. Don't forget those. There are some in the self-study portion at the end of this outline. And next time we're going to talk about the central nervous system. And it's going to be presented very, very differently from all of the other 
outlines in this chapter, I'm sorry, in this whole class, it's going to be presented very differently. Instead of uh, being an actual outline, it's going to be more of a list of structures that I want you to know. So when you get to the next chapter, keep that in mind. When you're reading and filling out the outline, it kind of jumps around the chapter, but you'll get a lot more out of that outline when you watch the lecture video. The lecture video really matches up with the next outline. The book, not so much. So, if you have any questions at all, let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next time. Take care.